Hey guys, get your coffee. Here we go. Pastor Randy here with a morning word. It's September the 10th, 2020. We want to give our thanks to all the people that serve our country, first responders and military people. Always try to remember you at the beginning of a morning word to say thank you for what you do. Without you, we couldn't do what we do. If you have your Bible this morning, we want you to go with us to the book of Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to be looking at one verse verse 23. And we want to talk to you this morning about the morning word by faith. You know, it's easy to talk about living by faith. It is difficult to do oftentimes because we have to embrace a word or a promise to the neglect of what we see and hear uh, that is going on around us. Remember, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So faith is always dealing in the unseen realm. Faith is always living on the word of God, the promises of God. It's based on the character of God and his faithfulness. And so when we talk about living by faith, we're talking about living really in another dimension. And living by faith is easy to say, but it's difficult to do. And one of the hardest places, if not the hardest place to live by faith in this world is with regards to our children. Our children, we're the one, we want a mother hen and uh, our children. We want to secure their future. We want to, you know, grease their skids. We want to make sure they have everything and love everything and love us and trust us more than anything. You know, y'all know that sappy stuff. That's how we are with our children. Uh, you know, I can live by faith with my money, but don't mess with my kids. I can live by faith in our country, but don't mess with my kids. You and I, without even realizing it, we take sole responsibility for our children. Now, what I'm talking about this morning is not releasing our responsibility, but what I'm saying is, is that we put our trust in ourselves to raise and secure our children in the way that we think God wants them to be. In other words, we become God to our children instead of God being God to our children. And I think that in that sense, we do them a great disservice. When I look out in this world that we're living in today, and I know that you, you that have children and grandchildren, and I have both, uh, you know, that I'm raising, when you look at the world, you, you, your heart begins to kind of ache and you get, get kind of get discouraged by where the, the direction of our, our nation is going. And, and I say all the time, you know, I, I, I'm saddened by the fact that my children will never get to grow up in the kind of world and the kind of country that I had as a, as a young man. And even then, my mom and dad said, man, I can't believe my son's growing up in the kind of world uh, that I didn't have, you know. So it, it, it's not something new, uh, but it's something that's ongoing. And of course, we live in an ever-increasing evil world. So we, um, we, we hurt for our children to think that, I mean, my, my God, man, every time I see a kid wearing a mask, when I see a, 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 f a five-year-old or six-year-old or a first grader or a second grader or a third grader, I saw a kid the other day, look looked like he might be in the first grade, walking along behind his mom and he's wearing a, a mask and I'm going, my God, they're living in, they're living in a, Groundhog Day Halloween that never goes away. I'm going, what kind of culture are we living in? And don't get me started on that because I just, I just want to scold the daylights out of some people. But we look at the way the world's going right now and we try to picture in our mind and we can't even really go there, you know, the kinds of things that they are, are seeing and hearing now. But my Lord, the kinds of things that they're going to see and hear and experience in the future. I mean, our country is is basically on the brink of a civil war, a race war, and uh, a cultural war. And and to think about some of the things that our kids are going to see and hear and experience and possibly suffer, and we're going, man, I, I just, you know, you, you, you won't let your mind go there because you can't really picture that happening. But... The reason we can't do that is because that, that or, or the reason we don't do that is um, because we've put, in, we've put too much responsibility on us. We've put too much responsibility on us, and, and you'll get what I'm saying in just a second. But before we read our scripture, we've got to remember that God is greater 
than any circumstance in life. God is greater than any cultural uprising. God is greater than any demise of a nation. God is greater than any pandemic. God is greater than any government entity, dictator, or antichrist, or whatever may come on the horizon. God is greater than that. God has navigated this earth for some 6,000 years of recorded history, and God has done some pretty amazing things. And thank God we have the Bible here that will show us of a, a set of parents who were living in more harsh and hard times in their day than we are right now in our day. So let's go to the scripture and let's look, listen to how two parents responded by faith to some of the most horrific times that they could possibly face as parents for their children. Are you ready? Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24. By faith, I mean, I'm sorry, verse 23. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. I'm gonna read it again. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because he saw, they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. What, what, do you, what does that mean? Well, you have to go back to the book of Exodus and remember this, that Israel at this time, they were a slave, natured, uh, slave nation to the Egyptian people. They were indentured servants. They, were ta they, they served under taskmasters. And the Pharaoh of Egypt at that time was so disturbed by the proliferation of the number of Hebrews in his country that he was afraid that if there was an uprising that occurred, that the Hebrews would side with the, their enemy and overthrow them and overthrow, overtake their nation. So here's what the Pharaoh decided to do. He decided that he would go and tell all the midwives of the, of the Egyptians, the ones that were helping assist the, the Jewish women, the Hebrew women with their children. Every male child that comes through the womb, I want you to throw in the river. I want you to kill them. Only the females can live. I want you to destroy the children. Now, guys, think about this. <clears throat> think about this. Think about what we're doing right now in our world and in our country. The United States of America leads the world by, by percentages in regards to abortion. Who, who do we think we're playing along with there? Is that a Pharaoh idea or is that a God idea? Uh, I mean, is that, a, is, that a, is that a God concept or is that a Pharaoh concept? And, and it's, it's to destroy a nation. That's what it's to do. It's to destroy a people. But, but that's for another teaching for another day. So Moses and um, Moses' parents, when he was born, his parents, uh, Amram and Jochebed, that was their names, they decided that they weren't going to kill their son. They decided that they were going to go against Pharaoh. Now, here's something I want to throw in. On, I want to throw this in here to all these... Uh, people that are quoting uh, Romans 13 and 15 and some of these other verses that said that we should always obey the government without understanding the context of that and the entirety of the Bible. If Moses' parents had obeyed the government, that was Pharaoh, remember their slaves, if they had obeyed the government, Moses would have been slaughtered at birth. He would have been drowned at birth. So the question is, is should they have obeyed the government then? No, absolutely not. So that'll be another teaching for another day. But they decided they were going to keep their baby. Now that's not that's important not only for Moses, but that's important because uh, for them too. Because here's what they were risking: if we have a child, if we have a male child, and we don't destroy him as we've been commanded by the government, hello, then not only will the government, if the word gets to them that we are not obeying them, they'll come and they'll kill the they'll kill our male child, they'll kill Moses, they'll kill our other children, Miriam and Moses' sister and other family members, and they'll kill us. So they were putting their entire family at risk to save one baby. But you know what they said? It's worth the risk. We are going to save this child. And you know what they did? They hid him as long as they could, and then they put him in uh, about three months, and then they put him in the, the little ark that they made and set him in the bulrushes, and they let him go. And they trusted God with his future. And you know the rest of the story. He was found by Pharaoh's daughter, given back to, to uh, Jochebed to raise 
uh, until he was weaned, which might have been two or possibly three years old in that day and time, given back to Pharaoh's daughter to raise up in Pharaoh's kingdom. Eventually, he's got his own story here in Hebrews, and eventually he, he, sur he gives away the kingdom of Egypt to embrace his people who are enslaved and has a purpose and mindset given to him by God to set the, his own people free. But here's the point. They put, them in, they put him in the ark uh, as slave parents and, and the little ark, the little, the little uh, thing that they basket that they made for him is a mini ark. They construct it with their hands, put pitch inside and out so it wouldn't leak, put the child in there, put a top on it, put him out in the reeds and then, and then hid to see what would happen with him. Now, here's what the deal is, guys. They did that in a time when all the male children were being commanded by the governing authorities to be destroyed. They did not destroy their son. And when they couldn't hide him anymore, they put him in a basket, put the lid on it, and put him in the river. Put him in the river. His name, Moses, means drawn out. He was drawn out of the river. That's, that's the name that was given to him by Pharaoh's daughter, drawn out. We took him out of the river. He was raised in Pharaoh's house. They would rather their child live in Pharaoh's house, okay, with God being in charge than to, than to destroy him out of their own self-preservation. And they, they trusted God. Now, they hid him as long as they, they could, and they put him in a basket, and they let go. Now, what should that tell us today? What should that tell us today? That God honors the faith of parents who put their children in the hands of God. We've got to put our children in the hands of God. We can't take credit for their successes and we can't take all the blame for their failures. We do the best we can. We love on them, we nurture them, we instruct them, and we, but we point them to Jesus because here's the deal. You and I cannot rescue them. We cannot save them, preserve them, keep them, escort them to the altar, then stay in their business till they die, tell them how to raise their children, make sure that the boogeyman don't get them. You know, we can't do that. We are not supposed to do that, but that's what we do. We feel like we're the ones who's supposed to pick out their spouse, pick out their vocation, pick out their school, pick out their clothes, pick out their cars, pick out their names for their kids, Every, we're supposed, we feel like we're, we're large and we're not, we're not. Our job, and that's what, uh, it's a, our responsibility is to do everything that we can to take them out of our hands and put them into God's hands. They are not supposed to be in these hands all their life. They are supposed to be in God's hands and we have to trust God. At some point in time, uh, we're gonna have to put them in the, in the little, in the basket, going to have to put the lid on it and set them in the water and say, God, they're yours. I mean, they're yours. I've done the best I could. I've failed a million times, and uh, but we've done the best we could. But ultimately, see, our faith and our confidence should not even be in our parenting skills. You shouldn't turn around and say, man, let me tell you what, I'm going to raise my kids right. Well, you ain't right. So how are you going to raise your kids right? You need God. We need grace. We need mercy. We need help. We need assistance. We need, you know, God may use Pharaoh's daughter, which is the, uh, the, the child of the enemy. You never know what God did. God, God raised that boy up in the middle of the arch enemy of Israel, raised him up in their house, and then turned around and used him to deliver a nation. So don't ever discount God's ability to take care of your children as they plan their ways that he can order their steps. God has a plan for every child conceived. God has a plan for every child conceived. And that plan most oftentimes does not look like the plan that we already had in our mind for our children. But that's okay. You know, you might have thought that your child was going to win Miss So and So and marry Mr. So and So and live over there and drive that and have this kind of life. They may not ever get married and they may flip burgers down there at Walmart, I mean, at, at uh, Burger King. But my God, God is not looking outwardly. God's looking at the heart and they may have the most tender, God-loving spirit and be just consumed with their love of God and have a life full of joy and hope and peace and be used by God in his kingdom. 
and you would look outwardly at their life and go, I failed. They're not married and they're flipping burgers at Burger King. But God said, they're not failed. I'm using them exactly where they are for my kingdom's purposes. Don't. We have got to destroy this paradigm of what success looks like. We've got to destroy this paradigm of uh, the direction our children should go. We need to get the scriptures and we need to point them towards Jesus. We need to teach our children not so much to have self-confidence, but to have God confidence. And that their self-confidence is rooted and grounded in God's word and in God's love for them. And our job is to wean them. Listen, it says that, uh, it goes on to tell in, in Exodus that the, Moses was given back to his mother until he was weaned. We have got to wean our children. Now, you can't wean your children if you stay up in their grill all the time and up in their house and up in their car and up in their business. Wean them so that they can stand on their own two feet, on their own faith, with their own relationship with God. Love them, be a part of their life, I'm not talking about cut them off and cut, you know, and slam the door and not let, let them back in. I'm talking about cut the umbilical cord. Life is about cutting things off so that it can live. Jesus said, you know, that unless a, 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 a falls to the ground, you know, unless a, a nut falls into the ground and dies, it will not bring forth the fruit. There's got, there's always got to be some separation. There's always got to be the end of something. I mean, unless a seed falls to the ground and dies, it will not bring forth fruit. There's got to be some separation. There's got to be some cutting off time. And that needs to begin from, from the very beginning. We need to, when we dedicate our children to the Lord at church, what we're saying is, God, I, you've selected me to parent these children, to love them and to nurture them, but, uh, but not in my way, in your way, to, to love them and to nurture them in the fear and the instruction of God, in the fear and the instruction of God, so that they grow up and the, the greatest impression that they should have of their parents is that my mama and my daddy are God-fearing parents that love Jesus and made hard decisions sometimes with regards to raising us because they love Jesus and pass to them a faith, pass to them your faith, pass to them your, 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 uh, your uh, convictions. That's what they need to leave home with. Not their Abercrombie clothes and their, and their uh, BMWs, you know, like the song says. Uh, they, uh, or the, the, I think in that song, there goes my baby, she was in a Honda. But who cares? You know, we always listen. And I'm just, I'm just trying to throw this in right here. We got to trust God with our children. But here's the deal. Giving them the best of everything is not necessarily the best thing to do. Okay? Giving them the best of everything is not necessarily the best thing to do. What we should do is give them the tools for them to do their best and let them have what their best brings. We are to give them the tools to help them do their best so that they can have the best that their efforts bring. Don't buy them the best car. Match them dollar for dollar and help them buy, when they work and help them buy the best car they can buy. Let them have some skin in the game. Let them say, man, let them be motivated by those dollars and by those uh, punching that clock so that they can go buy their own vehicle. And it may not look as good as everybody else, but it'll be theirs that they work for. And we will be teaching them those kind of things and let them trust God and let them believe God for some things. I didn't mean to get over into that too much like I did this morning, but here's the deal. We have to trust God with our children. And, you know, I'm 60, this is really hitting home. I'm 60 years old. I, I may, if Jesus tarries, be around here another 20 years. You know, I hope so. Uh, but, uh, you know, how productive I'll be. I may be blind as a bat and somebody feed me with, uh, feed me uh, liquid baby food. But I'm, I trust God. That's what, you know, the older you get, the more you have to trust God. I mean, because the less you can do, and I, 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 that's a sad thing, but it is the less you can do. So I have to say, God, I may not be around here to uh, for Micah, you know, 
and Elena or for Rhett and Ann Randall or for Annabeth's babies when she has them. I may not, I may not be around here. And so what I got to do is I got to shove that, I got to shove that basket as hard as I can towards God. I got to shove that basket down the river as hard as I can towards God. That's what I'm here for is to put my babies in that basket, the word of God, and shove them as hard as I can down that river towards God. Because I, I, my days of getting in the river is over with. I'm on the bank, baby. And, and life is going that way. And I've got to send my children into an uncertain future, but I got to do it with a certain confidence. And that confidence is going to be not in my papa, not in my mama, but in my God. We've got to trust them. And I want them to raise their babies and their babies like that. My Lord, don't give me, do not give to me and to my children uh, what I deserve with regards to parenting. Give me mercy. Give me grace and give them mercy and grace. May they trust in the Lord. So we love you guys. Hey, listen, we're taking up money for uh, Dave Turner. If you want to, if you want to, a give, you know how to give. It's online, the app, the website, top of the page here on Facebook, or you can mail it to New Beginning P.O. Box 1336 Northport 35476 and put on their prison ministry or Dave Turner, whichever one you want. We'll see you tomorrow. Good Lord willing and the saints don't rise.